All right, guys, let's start uh, Vodcast 7.3. We're going to talk about balancing equations. Um, this will seem very familiar to some of you all. Um, you probably have done some of this in middle school or maybe a little bit in uh, physical science if you took that. So everything here ties into the idea of a chemical reaction. Uh, what a chemical reaction is, is that any time a substance undergoes a chemical change, it's undergone a chemical reaction. Okay, now what that means to us then is that at the beginning of the year, we talked about a couple of things. We talked about physical okay and chemical changes and if you recall what we said was that it's a chemical change if it's different at the end it's a physical change if it's not so let's look at a couple of quick uh, scenarios here so I got water in its solid phase and it turns into water in its liquid phase that remember is a physical change first off any phase change is automatically physical but the real reason why it's a physical change is because this is the same chemical on both sides of the equation. Okay, It's solid in one phase and liquid in the other, but nothing else has really changed. On the other hand, if we took um, water in its liquid form okay, and we applied electricity to it, okay, nice Harry Potter lightning bolt, I know, then it's going to break up into hydrogen gas okay, and oxygen gas, which are two different chemicals. So what this means is that this now is a chemical change. Why is it a chemical change? Because I've got two different substances than what I had at the beginning. I had one co compound here and I've got two here at the end. Now you'll note that they're made of the same things. Okay, we'll see that's pretty important to us here in this section. But in, maybe in different amounts or it's the chemicals are rearranged and they're bonded in a new way. Okay. Um, if there's an energy change, now what that means is does something get hot or cold um, when we do it? You know, you're holding on to the test tube or you're feeling the side of it and it gets warm or it gets cold. Those are energy changes. Um, the one that we didn't talk about earlier in the year are odor changes. Um, that sounds like it's something really weird, but, but that just means that a smell evolved. Like you, you had two things that didn't really have an odor before and you combine them and all of a sudden there's, a, there's an aroma. That's an odor change. That's a chemical change. Also, one of the ways a lot of times you can tell that um, cooking um, is a chemical change. So like when you um, cook a steak, it has a different odor at the end while you're cooking it than it did at the beginning when it was just sort of a raw piece of meat. Um, a much better odor, I might add. Um, and then the release of a gas. Um, and that would go back to like the last one that we just saw or when we did our experiments earlier and you had the little bubbling up. Um, that's the release of a gas. If you see bubbles, that's a gas release. And so all of those things are indicators of a chemical reaction actually happening. Okay, this diagram should look pretty familiar to you. Um, we did this earlier in the year. And this is just talking about the parts um, of a chemical reaction. So remember, everything on the left-hand side is a reactant. Um, everything on the right-hand side is a product. Okay, um, then so everything left, left reactant, right product. Okay, the arrow itself is called the yield arrow. It means produces or results in. Then we have coefficients. Okay, so this is our coefficient. Coefficients are in front of chemicals, and they are big numbers. So the three and the two here are coefficients. Now, there's no coefficient in front of this, but we that's understood to be what? Okay, of course, it's understood to be a one. We don't usually write the ones down in chemistry. Um, and then we have subscripts. So subscripts are like the number three and all of the little twos down here. They're the numbers that are below, and that indicates how many of that element um, are in that compound. So like in this case, I've got one nitrogen and I've got three hydrogens. All right. But I have two ammonia molecules. This whole thing is known as ammonia. And I have two of them overall, even though within one of them, I have one nitrogen and three hydrogens. Okay. Now all of that is going to lead us into um, the idea of balancing equations that we're going to get to here in a second. So you can see chemical equations in all kinds of different ways. They can tell you different things. So um, you can see them written out in word form. Um, there's definitely a couple of those on the EOC and a couple on the test. Um, and that's where the naming stuff uh, comes in handy. You know, you have to know what acetic acid is. Remember, um, acetate, we would change the ending to IC. So basically, you take an acetate and then mix it with a hydrogen. That would give you the acetic acid. That would be this. Um, again, sodium hydrogen carbonate. Hydrogen carbonate is polyatomic. Acetate is polyatomic. We know how to name carbon dioxide. We know the fact that there's a prefix there means that it's a molecular compound, and so that would be one carbon and two oxygens. Okay, so we know how to name all those. And so that would be a word equation. 
We could also have a chemical equation where we actually write the formulas out, and that's kind of the normal way that we see them. Um, and then if you look down here at the very last thing, it's the same thing. It's a chemical equation, but next to each chemical is written its phase. Now, the phase doesn't matter quite as much to us now, but it's going to matter a whole lot um, to you if you go on into some higher science classes and some higher chemistry. So here's the heart of why we have to balance equations. We're going to work out a bunch of examples on how to balance equations, but here's the why. Okay, The law of conservation of mass says that we can't create or destroy matter in an ordinary chemical reaction. Remember, we did nuclear reactions, and, and technically we sort of can there, um, but even there, you know, we balance things to make sure they were the same on both sides. You had to make sure that if you had a 91, uh, pro or 91 atomic number on the left-hand side, that you had 91 on the other side, and so you added up your particles. That's the same thing we're going to do here, okay? So here's the way this works. If I wrote down what I have on each side, so I've got nitrogen and hydrogen on this left side of the equation. I have two nitrogens, okay, because that subscript, two times that, so that's two. And then for hydrogens, I have two in every molecule, and I have three molecules or three moles worth. And so that means that I have six hydrogens, okay? If we came over here to the other side of the equation, we have nitrogen and hydrogen again, and you should always have the same chemicals on each side of the equation. Um, but now, how many do I have? So I've got one nitrogen times two, so that gives me two, and I have three hydrogens times two. And that gives me six, so I'm balanced. I have the same amount on each side. Now, you might be saying, this two here, does that apply to everything? The coefficients apply to the whole chemical, okay? Subscripts, okay, so like in the case of this three here, they only apply to the atom or the element that they're talking about that they're right next to, okay? Coefficient applies to that whole chemical, not the whole side of the equation, but that whole chemical. So like this three includes this whole nitrogen, all right? So... Um, I was, normally I have like a slide of notes to explain like the rules for this, but I'm just going to walk you through these because I don't, I don't think copying down a slide full of notes is really going to help you to get how to do these. I think the best way to do it is just to work them out. So let's work some of these. So here's the way I like to do it. As soon as I get an equation that I have to balance, I just take a line and I draw it down the middle. Okay? And that means that stuff on the left-hand side, reactants, has to equal stuff on the right-hand side, products. Okay? And then I write down what I have. So aluminum hydrogen, and chlorine. And how many of each? I have one aluminum, one hydrogen, one chlorine on this side. So on the other side, you better have the same things. And what I find handy is, even though in this case chlorine is the next thing, I'm going to write it down here because I think it's easier to compare if they're on the same line with each other. Okay? And I do have hydrogen again, so I'm going to put that in its place. And then let's write down how many of each we have. I have one aluminum. I have uh, two hydrogens, okay, two, and then I have three chlorines. That three only applies to the chlorine. Now, I know that this isn't possible for some of you all, but what really helps, I think, a lot when you're doing these is if you use a different colored pen um, for when you're actually working everything out. So here's what's really important. I'm going to flash this up in a big, like, bold pop-up, but you can, the only thing you can do balancing-wise, you never, ever, ever change these numbers. They have to stay the way they are. The only thing you can do is put coefficients in front of stuff. Okay, that's it, nothing else. Okay, so real quick, let me run you through a couple of other sort of rules. You don't necessarily have to write them down, but this is the way they generally work. Um, you want to leave hydrogen or oxygen until, like, that's the absolute last thing you want to balance. You want to balance everything else first if you can, and then worry about that stuff. Okay, so aluminum is balanced right now. It's not going to be here in a second, but so I'm not going to work with it. I'm going to start with chlorine. I've got three over here, and I've only got one on the left hand side. So the way that I can correct that, since I can't change subscripts, is that I put a 3 in front of HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. Now, that changes my number of chlorines to 3. It also changes my number of hydrogens to 3. Okay? So that seems like that would work out pretty well. Unfortunately, if I look over on this side, what can I multiply by 2 to get me to... Three. Well, nothing really. And, and another important thing is that everything has to be in whole numbers. Okay, so it has to be in whole numbers at the end. So here's what I would do here. So what would make that, what would make that three? Well, technically, 1.5 would make that three, right? And I know that I have to have a whole number, so I'm going to kind of write that down at the bottom so that it's not really in the way. Um, and so that would even everything out, and now I would have three of everything, right? Now, I cannot leave a decimal number there. I have to have only whole numbers. So this is where I would go back through, 
And to get rid of that, I would multiply everything by 2. And that gives me 3 of those. Okay. I put a 2 in front of this, put a 6 here, and a 2 here. Now I would go back and count up and make sure of how many of each I have. So I've got 2 aluminums, I have 6 hydrogens, I have 6 chlorines, okay, 2 aluminums, all right, 2 times 3 is 6 chlorines, and 3 times 2 is 6 hydrogens, okay? So you might want to go back and look at that one again. We're going to work through another one here. Um, a little bit more complicated one just to make sure that we know how this works. Okay, so same deal. Cut it in half. Um, this is what we'll learn here in the next lesson is a combustion reaction where we've got something with carbon hydrogen added to oxygen. It's always going to produce CO2 and water. So I'm going to write down the elements that I have first. Okay. Then I'm going to write down how many of each I have. I have two carbons. Five plus one is six hydrogens, and that's important. You have to add up all of the sources of that element. So in this case, I've got two oxygens here and one here. That's going to give me three total oxygens. On this side, I've got one carbon, okay, two hydrogens, and then I've got two plus one is three oxygens. Now, oxygen is usually the hard one, so you're like, oh, it's balanced already. It's obviously not going to stay that way. So I said leave hydrogen and oxygen till last if possible, so I'm going to do carbon first. So I'm going to put a 2 in front of this, and that's going to give me 2 carbons. And now it's going to change it to 2 times 2 is 4 oxygens here, but plus the 1 here, so that's 5. Okay, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. All right, so now that's balanced. Now the other stuff is not balanced. So once I get to that point, I'm going to do hydrogen before I do oxygen then. Okay, so I'm going to, I've got 6 over here. I've got 2 over here. So 2 times 3 would give me 6. Okay, now again, that also changes my oxygen. So now I've got three from this one. Three times one is three, plus two times two is four. So that gives me a total of seven oxygens now. Okay, so now I come back over here to this side and say, what can I do over here to make this work out? Well, I have one oxygen here. So really, I need this oxygen to equal out to be six because I've already got one here. So what times two equals six? That would be 3, okay, and so 3 times 2 gives me 6, plus 1 gives me 7, and I'm done, okay? Note that we didn't write the 1 here. That's understood. You can sort of leave that off. All right, let's try one more real quick. Cut everything in half. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different in this case, okay? I'm going to show you a technique that sometimes can save you some trouble. When you have a polyatomic, okay, like I do right here, a lot of times what helps is that if you don't break it up into its elements, if you keep all of the polyatomic together, okay, because typically in reactions, the polyatomic is not going to break up, okay, it's going to stay together and just switch from place to place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat it like it was one thing by itself. So on this side, I have one sulfate, right? It, there's no parentheses, and so that must mean one. Over here, I do have parentheses, so that means I have three sulfates, okay? Um, and then go back and count up everything else. So I've got one aluminum, all right? I've got three bromines, two potassiums. Okay, on this side, I've got two aluminums, one bromine, and one potassium, okay? So now in this case, I don't really have any oxygen other than it being in the sulfate, so I can kind of do what I need to do to it. So we're just going to jump right in. I'm going to put two aluminums here, okay? So that's going to make this 2. It's going to change my bromine to 6. 2 times 3 is 6. Okay, so that's balanced now. Now my bromine is not, so I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to put a 6. It gives me 6 bromines. Also gives me 6 potassiums. Okay, so I'm just sort of working my way down the list here. Come over here, I've got 2 in this one, so I need it to be 6. So 3 times 2 equals 6. Okay, so that's my 6. Now, how many sulfates do I have? I would have three sulfates, right? Because I've got three in the total reaction. So now I've got three and we're balanced. And I didn't have to worry about all the complicated stuff with oxygen. And that's the reason why it's usually pretty useful to leave the polyatomics separate when you're balancing equations. All right. Thanks, guys. I hope that was illuminating. We'll do lots of practice on this, just like we did naming and make sure we get all this stuff. Um, and, and just, you got to keep plugging away at it. It's trial and error, so don't get frustrated. If it doesn't work out, stop, erase, and start over. All right, thanks.